Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through my Curse of Strahd campaign that I'm running in the Shadow Dark system. In this episode, which is part 11, I think, I'm going to be covering basically two sessions that we had. One of them was really short, it wasn't a full session. Basically, we had met to discuss what to do, because one of my players had to drop out. He's, he's hopefully going to come back in at a later date, but uh, the character, the, the player who was playing Pavel, just decided that, you know, things were coming up too much in his own personal life, and he was doing a lot of stuff, and he just had to, he couldn't do a campaign consistently. And so, because we had canceled, you know, a few weeks in a row in order that he could play, and he was just not consistent. And even when he did, was able to play, he was just on the road, and so his connection was bad. And, and so we were like, look, we'd like to keep playing. And he was like, that's totally fine. Uh, when I get more uh, stable, you know, setup, then I'll uh, I'll be able to jump back in. So the session where we discussed that, and where we, we had tried to have him, you know, uh, zoom in and it didn't work and then uh, he dropped out and we were like okay what are we going to do at that point so we played a little bit of a session then that was a few weeks ago that was right before Christmas and then we played one session after that where we had a full session with just the three other players um, and that was great these are both you know again even the session that was kind of a part session it was really fun it was sort of a wrapping up of what had previously happened if you guys remember in the last one Part 10, the, the party had split four ways when they got to Velaki. They had gone to speak to different people. Pavel and uh, Pavel and Arthur had gone to the Blackwater to gamble and to figure out what was happening there, to talk to sort of the un more unsavory elements in town. And then from there they had split. Pavel had gone because he wanted to get a hunter hunting license to go hunt wolves at night because Blocky has a curfew, and so you need, a, you need an official seal to hunt after, to come out after dark and to go hunt and stuff. And so he uh, he wanted to go get a a license, and so he left. And Arthur stayed behind and gambled and cheated and got you know caught and kicked out. <laughs> and so then he didn't know where Pavel was, and so he kind of went off his own way. So they had split up. And then the other two uh, characters, um, Varya had spoken to Sister Blanca of the Order of the Silver Scale. And she had tried to figure out, kind of, you know, see what her character was like, see what she was, see what this, the order was like and what they were willing to do. And, and she came away from that meeting, Varya did, very wary of the order of the Silver Scale. Like, they are definitely uh, interested in, in annihilating all of the undead. They're definitely interested in standing against Strahd. They're definitely interested in helping the people in a very broad sense. But they are zealous, and they are determined, and they see everything in, in black and white. And they don't. There's no shades of gray. And so for Varya, who herself is cursed by the Book of Strahd, uh, and who sees spirits and who can kind of channel them, and for Pavel, who is a werewolf, right, this seemed like a dangerous alliance at best because, you know, they are tainted, and the Order of the Silver Scale would probably not look kindly on that. So she was... Uh, she saw that as sort of like, okay, well, we could definitely come to these people for help. They're going to have a lot of stuff. But we have to keep that in mind. Well, we have to keep in mind what we'll be doing if we if we join with them. And then Ulysses had gone to speak to Rictavio the Wondrous and Erwin Mardikov over at the Blue Water, which is the other inn in town. So I added in the Black Water, but uh, the Blue Water is the, uh, is the other one. It's from the book. Now, if you guys remember, I had I've made Rictavio is not, um, he is not uh, Rudolf Van Richten. Rictavio is a is just a wandering bard. Now he he is friends with Esmeralda. He's basically her companion, and he helps her get into towns, and he helps her kind of maintain a presence, and he has sort of a front for her so that she can do her monster hunting, uh, you know, and and figure out what's really going on beneath the surface, but he is the he is the face. And so he's been stuck here in Velaki while she went out to Kresik. And so he's worried about her because they haven't heard from her in some time. So basically Ulysses and Erwin and Rictavio took each other into their confidence and they all realized they're on the same page. Uh, Rictavio and Erwin had already done that. Ulysses said, hey, here's all my cards, putting them out on the table. And Erwin, who had been been watching him and he and his children had been watching him as where raven said we know <laughs> we know who you are we know you're here to help and here's what we're doing and here's what we know so that was a a, a great source of comfort i think to them they realized okay here are a couple people that they that we can really rely on to some degree rictavio was a little silly he's a little uh typical bardish right he's 
uh, very fanciful. He thinks very highly of himself. He speaks in very flowery language. He's probably not terribly, terribly competent, but he does have connections already in the city amongst the nobility. He's made friends. Um, he is invited to parties. He has a, a seal which allows him to walk around after dark because he's friends with the, the various nobles of, of Velaki. He has a, a, a paper that lets him do it. So that right there was something that they, they realized that we can use this. And when Arthur, because Arthur and, and uh, Varya came to the Blue Water later, they, Arthur immediately said, hey, can I see that? Now his background is as a um, charlatan. And so he was like, well, I'm a forger, right? so I can forge a document. Uh, now, we won't be able to forge the seal, but we'll be able to forge the document and the signatures. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you probably could. And so he he did his best. He um, he rolled really highly. He rolled like with a, with a, I think I made him do a dex check or an intelligence check at advantage, and he rolled like a 22 or something like that. So I was like, yeah, you definitely, you make a document that looks pretty much exactly like the official one, except it doesn't have a seal. And they did that over the course of an afternoon. He was like, all right, great. So now I just need a seal. So they thought, well, we could either like rip off that part of the, the paper that had the seal, the quote unquote, had the seal on it and say, oh yeah, there was an accident. You know, it was basically the idea was if we get stopped at night, we'll have something. And then maybe that'll help us like, you know, we can use a bribe or we can do a little, you know, uh, persuasion. And maybe with the document, we'll be able to have a chance to not get arrested if we're, if we're caught after dark. So it gave them, and, and I, I told them that I was like, yeah, what this will do is it will give you a chance to roll a persuasion check instead of just being like brought to jail, right? <laughs> That's what this will do or a deception check or something like that. And they were like, all right, cool, cool. That's what we want. So, so they, uh, they, they now have, you know, at least some cover in order to walk around after dark. So that right there, in Velaki, so that right there is a huge boon. But as I mentioned last uh, in the last one, they had sort of discussed what to do, and they realized they decided that they were going to go to Kresik and then up to the Abbey of St. Markovia for a couple of reasons. One is they wanted to take, uh, they wanted to take, um, uh, basically they, they wanted to go somewhere safe. <laughs> and so the Abbey seemed like the safest place in the safest place in the valley, in, in Barovia left. Um, now, Irina is still with them, and they want her somewhere safe. They don't want to be dragging her around with them the whole time. They don't want to leave her in Velaki just, like, on her own. Now, her friend Frilsha is there, and so they took... It, they, actually, that was one thing that they did in that shorter session. Actually, there were a couple things that were interesting in that shorter session I want to mention. Uh, Varya took her to see Frilsha, and Frilsha said, Well, I'm going to the Abbey of St. Markovia. My brother is a monk there. And uh, my father's, you know, dead. He just recently died, maybe a few months ago. Uh, I have no reason to stay in Velaki. Things are getting crazy here. Things are getting really unsafe here. Uh, I don't, I don't trust anything here. I'm going to go to the Abbey and stay. My brother has invited me. You should come with me. To Irina, and the party was like, mm, "This is an opportunity. We could send Irina over with Frilsha to the Abbey, and they would be safe there." But they thought, "Well, would they make it safely there? Because of all the stuff happening." And so they decided, well, we'll escort them to Kresik, and then from Kresik they can find their way to the Abbey. So this is great. It's awesome for a couple of reasons. One is it gets them all out of, it gets them into Kresik, which I wanted them to get to. It also gets Irina into the Abbey of St. Markovia without their protection. Because as I've already maybe mentioned, that the abbot is basically Dr. Frankenstein. I mean, he's creating these things, and he wants a perfect uh, vessel and Irina will be the perfect vessel. So I think that's what's going to be happening is that he has this, like, I, I don't know exactly the whole plan yet because I haven't developed the uh, Abbey thing. But now they're basically bringing him uh, this vessel that he will want to try to use. So they will have to come and rescue Irina in a very typical, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, lightning, thunder from the top of the Abbey. Uh, you know, she'll be strapped to a machine and it'll be like about to be turned on. Like, it'll be a classic scene, <laughs> you know, from from uh, those, those you know, action horror movies like Van Helsing or something like that. So anyway, it was perfect and it's setting it up perfectly. So I, I'm very happy about that. Now that hasn't actually happened yet, but that was one thing. The other is that uh, Varya went to see Blinsky. She passed by Blinsky's toys. Now, if you guys remember, Blinsky is Rudolf Van Richten in my game. I'm making him Rudolf van Richten. Basically, Blinsky was this old toy maker in Velaki ages ago who left to you know, retire to the capital. And then recently, he's returned. And that's kind of odd. People were like, oh, yeah, he came back like six months ago. Um, 
and he set up his old shop, and it's kind of interesting. He's not quite the same as he used to be, and but he's basically the same. It's good old, it's good old, you know. But he's been gone so long, people don't really remember him all that well. And so Rudolf van Richten, who met him in the capital, has made himself look like him, you know, with makeup and magic and, and sort of prosthetics and things, and and is now pretending to be this toy maker to keep an eye on the town. So that's where Rudolf van Richten is. And so they went to see him, and it was great because uh, they were really unnerved by the creepy toys. But they were also kind of unnerved by his friendliness. I played him straight out of the book, as, as he's described in uh, in the book, as really friendly and lighthearted and not creepy in his manner. And that unsettled Varya. She was like, it's such a weird contrast that this guy is so nice and friendly and seems great, contrasted with the horrible, creepy toys he's making. Um, and so it was just a great, unnerving, unsettling moment. One of the things that they found there was a doll that looked exactly like Irina, and that really freaked them out. Later on, um, Ulysses went there and bought that and gave it to Irina. <laughs> it was really funny. Uh, so now Irina has the doll that looks exactly like herself. So anyway, that was stuff that happened in Vallaki. So they decided to leave uh, all in a big group in the morning with Frilsha and her maidservant and travel west to Kresik. And uh, they did, you know, bright and early they left. And as they were riding out, they decided, well, let's skip Jenny now because they were going to go talk to Jenny Greenteeth. Um, they had been advised to talk to her as someone who knew a little bit about uh, a little bit about the the town, but also who was able to provide you know potions and tinctures and perhaps things like that. And they were like, "Well, that does sound useful, but we don't really. Have, let's just go, and we'll come back if we come back soon. We'll go talk to her." So they they just get right past her, and they rode west up through the uh, up through the road. Now, basically, I described uh, this side of Barovia is a little less um, a little less. Uh, you know, affected by all the darkness, or by at least it seems like it. Like there, you pass by villages and towns, uh, you know, Slavodia, Varesht, where it seems like there are genuinely um, still people around. A lot of people have left to go to Velaki, but you can still see that there are people around. There aren't destruction. The the, the farms and the, the the harvests look small and maybe a bit rotted in places, withered, but they're still there. It's not it's not as destroyed as Eastern Barovia or as Outer Barovia. But by the time they got to Varesht, which was the last of these towns uh, west of Vallaki and the road south, uh, things had gotten a little bit worse. And as soon as they left Varesht and started going along the road, there was just a, a really abandoned countryside. But then they arrived right here at this little unmarked tower on the road with the south road to Kyoken or Sioken. And I described it as they were going up. It's an old ruined church or like a shrine maybe along the side of the road and up ahead they could see it and it looked like there were a handful of people gathered around in front and just waiting there and they were like uh oh what's that so they had half of the group stay behind and uh the main three arthur ulysses and varia rode up to it and essentially it was a bunch of bandits that had just set themselves up here and they were collecting a toll for the master for the for the lord of barovia so basically, this is now like going to start happening, right? People are now going to be serving the rising Strahd uh, because he's back, and so his his servants have spread through the the, the region, and so and some people have said like, oh, well, now we're on, now we're in league with him, especially the unsavory types." And so these bandits were like, "Yeah, we're we're uh, here collecting a toll. So lay down all your weapons, give us all your money, and you can pass." And then one of them started talking in a very creepy way, like a very, like, possessed way. And there, even the other bandits were unsettled by him. And he was like, you know, the master. Uh, the master will return. The master will return. And they, of course, were not willing to back down the party because they're like, we, have, we need our weapons. We need our money. We're not just going to give it away. But there were like 10 of these bandits and some of them had guns. And it was like, oh, man, we're in real trouble. And they said that. They were like, you know, this could kill us all. But it's what our characters would do, and it is, it's necessary. Plus, it's also really cool and cinematic, so we fight. And so they started this fight, and it was great. A couple of the guns jammed by the, uh, the bandits. A couple of them went off and missed. A couple of them hit, winged, you know, a couple of the, the players. The horses kind of scattered or, or panicked. Arthur jumped behind his horse in a classic cowboy style and started shooting from behind it, you know. Ulysses used his horse and spurred it right towards the guy who was casting spells. I just had him roll an attack. I had him roll a d8 at advantage to damage and he did max damage and he like trampled the guy and then Varya cast a, a spell at him and, and Arthur shot him all at the same time and just they all killed him right dead and so that like the death of their leader right away I had everybody roll a morale check and they fail 
they rolled really badly on the morale check. So the bandits just scattered. It was great because it was this, it, it felt very cinematic. They managed to kill a couple of them. Uh, one of the guys kind of held his ground a bit more because he didn't have a horse to escape on. The rest of the bandits kind of got their horses and ran. Uh, but the, one of them didn't have his uh, horse to escape on. So he stood his ground and then he fought back and they killed him pretty quickly. He, he, he was kind of, uh, I used the barbarian stat block. So he kind of flew into like a frenzy and started to attack. And they're like, oh, we got to kill this guy. So they did. Uh, but then they found out, once they did that, they went into the old ruin and they found a couple bodies of travelers, a few bodies of travelers, and a lot of gold and stolen items and stuff. These people had been at it, right? So people who had been fleeing to Velaki, they had just been there stopping on the road and, and robbing them blind, basically. Um, or killing them if they resisted. So the party felt really good about this, but it was a great moment, it was a great cinematic moment. It was, a, it was the first fight in the game against humans, and that actually was, was kind of important because uh, Varya was like, you know, this... I think this sticks with me, the fact that we killed a couple of these people. These are actual people. These aren't monsters. These aren't vampires, right? These aren't zombies. <laughs> these aren't wolves. These are people. And so that stuck with her, and she played that really, really well. Um, now, by the way, Pavel, who is the fourth member of the party, uh, he's not with them. Uh, we're not NPCing him. He stayed behind in Velaki. He sent them a message that said, I'm fine. I'm doing you know, things in the city. Go on without me. I'll try to catch up when I can. So they were like, all right. So they so they left a message in here for Pavel. They kind of scratched something on one of the old wine barrels in there. They said, you know, we're moving on to Crescent. But one of the things that happened there was when Arthur went to rob or loot, <laughs> of course, because he's a, he's a thief. He loots. Um, he went to loot the dead body of the, the leader, the one who had been trampled with a horse. The guy was dead. He'd been shot. He'd been uh, you know, ghosted <laughs> by Varya's power, and he'd been uh, trampled by the horse. He was very dead. His body like reached up and grabbed Arthur by the lapel of his shirt and like dragged him down in a rasping voice, said, Strahd, or something like that, and Arthur was freaked out. It was great. So that was a good moment. It was a lot of fun. Then they rode west uh, out of that because they were heading to Kresik. And uh, as they got to about Odoi here, they started to, as they crossed the river, this little, uh, this little river, which is the Viper Creek. Um, as they crossed the Viper, they started to see these little shrines set up. They weren't shrines to saints, or they weren't shrines to the light. They were shrines with little effigies on them. And uh, they didn't recognize what they were, although uh, Frilsha, who was riding behind them, and uh, joined them at this point, or riding with them, but who had stayed behind during the fight, but was, was with them, uh, recognized them as sort of old pagan totems, like witchcraft totems, uh, or witchcraft, uh, you know, uh, kind of effigies. And uh, the party was like, great, we're riding into witches, aren't we? Because they had already heard, they already knew from way back when that Western Barovia is where they're still, even before all this stuff started to happen, there was still sort of a, uh, a folk tradition of witchcraft and a folk tradition of at least reverence for the Lady of the Wood, which is this, this sort of spirit figure that uh, is sort of the object of their, of their uh, ceremonies and stuff. And, and they had gotten a sense that there was some witchcraft happening even with the... With the uh, Gosh, with the, um, I can't think of the word right now. The Vistani, that, that, that Madame Eva had been kept under, perhaps by a, a spell from witches or something like that. But they weren't sure, and now they were like, oh, great. Okay, so this part of that's what's going on here. Now, um, they saw a bunch of, like, you know, slightly offerings to these shrines. There were some dead animals. There were some gold coins. There were some lockets. There were some teeth, like some little creepy offerings uh, to these different shrines as they rode along the road. But they, they eventually got to Kresik, and as they got to Kresik, they, they, the Kresik I'm using is sort of a, I'm using a map of the, uh, I'm using this map of the city here. And, uh, and so there's an outer city with a wall, and then it's over the river, and then there's a northern city here. I don't really know where I got this, but I like it a lot um, as, a, uh, as a map of the city. And as they're riding up to the south gate here, number seven, there were these two effigies hanging by the neck out on either side of the gate and the two guards were standing there sort of like shell-shocked and they were like what's going on here and the two guards just said one of them just said witches and that's where we ended the session so that's where they are they're at the gates of Kresik about to go in to a city that's been infested with witches um, and is undergoing witch trials and witch burnings and uh, it's gonna be <laughs> I think it's gonna be great 
Uh, now, the city is also very much abandoned. There are not people left there. People have fled Kresik for the, the, the... A lot of them have fled for Velaki. Kresik was never as populous as Velaki to begin with, but it's it's emptied out of a lot of people, and a lot of people have fled their surrounding farms and the regions and just have, have tried to empty out of the city because it's not, it's not safe here. There's stuff happening here. Um, a lot of people try to get out. So Kresik is going to be a little bit abandoned. Not as abandoned as Barovia was, but certainly not as crowded and busy as Velaki was. I want it to be much more, uh, you know, much more uh, isolated in that way. So their their plan was to get a coach from Kresik for uh, Irina, Frosha, and, and Frosha's maidservant up to uh, the Abbey. That's still available. That there still are coaches that run from Kresik, so they can certainly do that. And I think that probably is what the party will do, get her, get Irina out of Kresik as quickly as possible. But the plan here is to figure out what's going on and to try to find, um, to try to find Esmeralda as quickly as possible. But that's where my prep is going to have to come in because I am not exactly sure what's happening. <laughs> now, I know a few things. So, oh, they also passed the windmill. They also passed the windmill on the way, uh, the bone grinder. So I, uh, I showed them this, you know, classic picture of the bone grinder as they rode past on the road. I said, you see this old abandoned windmill? So they know that, I mean, I don't think they know what it is, but uh, they saw it at least. Uh, I have a bunch of NPC art for this town, uh, a bunch of characters. Uh, and then I have my document here of the different groups and factions. So I have the Burgomaster who's Baron Seeger Svobodnik uh, and his dead wife, Lady Indra Valeska. Uh, and I have the Church of St. Ferris, Ferens, uh, and the dead Father Botley Braknikov. Now, uh, the church has been burned very recently, like in the last three or four days, maybe even the last two days, the church has been burned down. So um, there's there's a dead priest inside, and there's no other priest. There's Landru the Dorman, who was sort of a sort of a simple acolyte of the church, but he doesn't really know what's going on. Then there are the hunters, which are uh, the watchers, Abner and Mitna. These guys are basically like you know, sort of police. <laughs> they're, uh, they're law enforcement, uh, what little law enforcement there is left in the city. Then there are the Vistani, who are outside of town. There's Oleg, Lumilla, Karaman, Kinder, and Malaski. And they, the, the, the uh, Vistani camp nearby is, is pretty, pretty big. Then I have the Daughters of the Wood, and these are the, the, the witches or the, uh, the hag's daughters in town who are associated with the hag. Um, and that's uh, Mother Rega, Sister Vivin, Sister Tika, Tika and Sister Mirren Klokesia. And then I have some NPCs and what's going on there. So I have Gunner at Gunner Stables, Bartak at Bartak's Bakery, because only some of these were just the... Um, the names from the map, and I wanted to keep them consistent. So Semyon's General Store, uh, Elegan, who is the owner of the Burntwood, which is one of the taverns here. And then I have Yakov, which is the Red Rabbit Tavern and the Inn. And then I have the Wizard of Wines Tavern, and that's been closed down. And the Wizard of Wines is where uh, it's it sort of was one of the uh, the good places in town. It's where uh, Esmeralda was going. It's where her, she was staying. Um, it's where the uh, Mardikovs obviously have connections, but it's been closed down very recently, and the people there have fled. They've gone to their actual winery. That's where they have now been under assault by the hags and things, so I think that's what's going on here. Then I have a real quickly what's been going on. So the Burgomaster has been turned into a werewolf. That's something that's actually going on here. And has been terrorizing the countryside. The witches are convincing the townsfolk that only they can protect them, and so far they have done so. The Vistani are targeted as the source, and tensions are rising. The church has been burned, and the old priest was killed. It was the witches, but everyone suspects the Vistani. Two Vistani were caught and hanged. Esmeralda, or maybe burned, it was probably better. Esmeralda was staying at the inn and investigating what was happening. The Wizard of Wines was a hideout for the were-ravens, but they were killed and taken. Uh, she discovered that the meat that they meet nearby and went to catch them. Uh, the, the witches, that is. Uh, she's been caught by the druids of Yester Hill and will be burned in the Wicker Man, man soon when, if the players start to investigate. She questioned Sister Vivin, who broke and told her, but she was observed and captured shortly after leaving. She was talking to Vivin, but as a Vistani, most locals aren't sympathetic. So what's going to be happening, I know, at, as when the players arrive? when the players enter, or when the characters enter, there is a witch burning in progress. And I don't know yet exactly what's going on. I think what'll happen is it's gonna be an innocent younger girl 
and uh, she's just been accused of it. And the players will have to decide if they're going to try to save her or not. And if they try to save her, they can, because the Burgomaster is not even going to be present. The Watchers aren't even going to be present. It's just going to be a mob, basically. A mob is burning, is about to burn an innocent girl. Now, that's the question is who? I don't really have uh, a good piece of art for an, uh, a, a, a young girl. I can go into character art, random NPC portraits. Um, none of these work. Hmm. I wonder if I have any in... In a, I, well, I'll find it. It's not a big deal. It's not a huge deal yet. Um, the players can intervene, obviously. Um, named, uh, Yina. Just do Yina. She is accused of, um, hexing the, uh, hexing the, uh, who would be a good person to, to hexing how about Bartak? Into giving her free bread. He is afraid of his wife, who is Vivin. And so accused the girl rather than admit to giving away little bread they had left. Something like that. And so, uh, uh, charming. That will be what's going on when they get there. And then I, I know what else is going on. So basically they'll find out that there is a werewolf. It's the Vistani. But the Vistani uh, have, uh, there are hags, there are witches, uh, the mob is, uh, you know, wary of everyone, but the witches are starting to convince some people that the only solution is their, is their witchcraft. That the, the church is now burned, there's no hope there, um, and there's no hell coming, so, you know, turn to us and we'll help you. Outside the city, um, the Wizard of Wines is... Um, has been taken by the druids and witches, all in service of Baba Isaga. So the locations nearby. Locations nearby. We have the Wizard of Wines Winery. The uh, Yester Hill, Old Bone Grinder, and Baba Lissaga's Hut. All right, so those are four places that they can go, and and I think that there will be some connection. The Wizard of Wine's Winery closed for some time, but. Uh, Evidence of Esmeralda's presence and Hag's daughters and druids still present there. Yester Hill, the site of many ceremonies and rituals. Druid and mother uh, conduct them here. Old Bone Grinder, um, a hag, and several hag's daughters work here. Um, reside here. 
both Yester Hill and Baba Lusaga's hut. And then Baba Lusaga's hut, the home of the hag, home of the lady. find hard to kill all right so these are this is basically what's going on i think oh uh, of course there's also the couple of the places there is the burgo masters mansion and the Vistani. burgo masters mansion he was turned into a werewolf by witches, but has become convinced that it was the Vistani and torments them nightly. Are Uh, terrified and ready to fight back. Something like that. So things are real bad here. Tensions are high and uh, it's unclear what's going to happen, but we're going to see tonight. We're going to see tonight because I imagine they're going to uh, come to town. They're going to, they're, they're, there's sort of a, something to happen right away, which is this burning that they're going to try to prevent or hopefully try to prevent. That would be my, my, you know, fingers crossed they try to prevent it. If not, they just let the girl burn. I suppose like, they could do that too. But I don't think this group will do that. Uh, then they'll they'll stop it. They'll probably send Irina and um, and Frilsha up to the Abbey. Meanwhile, the rest of them will stay in town and try to find Esmeralda. They'll ask around. Uh, they'll probably find out that she has been she was hanging around the Wizard of Wines, uh, investigating it, and then that will connect them to the winery. Uh, and so then they can go find the winery. Then they'll go there and they'll find the hag's daughters and druids there and they'll find evidence of her presence, but she's been taken and they will then go to, um, they will have evidence of, of, of or they'll find evidence, right? Of maybe Yester Hill, um, or maybe they can go back to town and find out about Yester Hill, whatever it might be. Or uh, they'll also find out about a bone grinder and the hag there and the hag stutters are there and that is maybe something that she was also looking into so there's an old windmill and an old winery that she was investigating and they can choose which one to go to and the windmill they'll know that there it's it's got it's a cursed reputation um no one goes near it but she went near it and uh and then, so that will be one thing they go investigate either way it'll lead them to yester hill so the bold bone grinder and the wizard of wines winery lead them to yester hill Baba Saga's hut, I don't know how they're going to find that. Now, the other thing they could go to look at, look into is the Burgomaster's werewolf stuff um, and the Vistani, because that's that's the accusation. That's sort of a red herring, but it's not an entirely red herring. There's actually an adventure there. There is a werewolf, and if they were to solve that, then it would help a lot, um, because it is this monster who's, who's ruining everything, right? So there are several ways they could, they could go here. Um, and I think probably... Um, well, maybe I'll change something because I might, I might make it so that, yeah, maybe he's trying to bring his wife back. No, he's not trying to bring his wife back. Uh, I think he's just, I think he's just angry. All right. Well, I think that's, that's, that'll have to do it for today. So anyway, we'll see how this one goes. I hope this has been interesting to you guys and I'll see you in another video.